the TV in the attic. I found an old dust-riddled TV in the attic of the home me and my family just moved into today. It was just sitting in the middle of the attic, nothing else around it, nothing else in the entire house as a matter of fact. It was quite strange. Who just leaves the TV and nothing else, I thought. As I approached the old 1983 Zenith, I noticed a notebook that sat on top. I reached down and picked it up. I flipped back the cover, and on the first page it read, To whom it may concern, read carefully the information inside the pages of this book that I've collected, for they could save you and your loved ones, and whatever you do, please don't turn on the television that lies before you. As I stumbled through the pages, I noticed pictures of families and drawings of demonic symbols. I was becoming quite disturbed at this point, so I decided to close the notebook and read it carefully. Later in the night, when my wife and kids went to bed, I tucked the notebook under my arm, headed downstairs and helped bring in the rest of our things. After we got everything squared away and put in its place, we ordered some pizza, ate, then I put the kids to bed and kissed my wife goodnight. I told her I'd be in a little later after I finished up some work in the study. I went in and locked the door to the study behind me, sat down and pulled the notebook from the bottom desk drawer and placed it in front of me. It read like instructions on how to put the most difficult of toys together on Christmas morning. The details and information that was collected was outstanding. It turns out the notebook was written by the home's previous owner, and after the strange disappearances of his family, he set out and tried to find out what happened. He revealed that the television was sitting in the attic alone when he and his family moved into the house as well, and strange things didn't start happening until it was plugged in and turned on. Almost instantly, strange things started to happen when the television was turned on. It made a loud, deafening pop when he first switched it on. Then an eerie, bone-chilling breeze that emanated from upstairs and wafted throughout the living room. Next came the loud noises that could be heard from up in the attic whenever somebody turned the TV on that sounded like footsteps all across the attic floor. Then came the distant chanting whenever the TV was switched on. It almost sounded cult-like, which all led to his family acting peculiar and changing before his very eyes. Their moods and personalities completely changed. They became despondent, glossy-eyed, catatonic, if you will, almost if they were possessed. Then, not long after they started to change, they disappeared, always last being seen watching the television. He was devastated, but had to find out what happened to his family. He did painstaking research about the history of his home and its inhabitants and made countless calls, tracked down any surviving family members of the past residents, and interviewed as many locals that would speak with him. He found that this exact thing that was happening to him and his family had happened to the previous five families that owned the home and that the original owners met a grisly end in their own right. And another disturbing detail was that the TV was always involved in every single case. It belonged to the original family that owned the home, he found out through family members that knew. It sat upstairs in the attic, which was also the family rec room at the time, and sat in the middle of the room when the entire family was sacrificed by a cult they were trying to save their daughter from. The family was massacred and strewn around the attic, blood everywhere, including all over the television where demonic symbols were drawn on the backs and sides, and on the screen written in Latin, that was transcribed saying, For whomever turns on this screen, 
will awaken our master and will usher him into our earthly realm. And whomever watches what is on the screen will become an unshakable servant. Ex-police officers who were at the scene of the murders that he interviewed say the television was removed as evidence, but somehow disappeared and made its way back to the house and has been present with every family that moves in since. And every family slowly disappears, just like the previous one. He then finishes up with a list of things to do to try and avoid the same fate as the previous families. 1. Don't turn the television on. Don't even plug it into the wall. Seems self-evident there, pal, I thought. 2. If the television does get turned on, do not watch the screen and immediately turn off the TV and leave the premises at once. And three, if the television has been turned on and someone has watched it, don't let that person out of your sight. You may be able to protect them. Please don't let them disappear. He then closes with a bunch of incoherent sentences, then writing the same word over and over again, like he was losing his mind, and finish with a barely legible, Help me. I closed the notebook, trembling, not knowing what to believe. I started thinking back at how our purchasing of this house transpired. Yes, it was on the cheaper side, which I can see why now. And come to think about it, the realtor did seem to dodge the question when we asked why would the previous owners get rid of such a beautiful home. My head was spinning at this point. I decided to go to bed and figure out what to do in the morning. I slept horribly, having terrible nightmares about the television and one of my kids turning it on. I decided the first thing I would do when I got out of bed and dressed is throw the TV away before it was too late. I got my clothes on and made my way downstairs to the kitchen. I heard my wife and kids already up making breakfast in the kitchen. I walked in and greeted their smiling, happy faces. I sat down at the table and started to eat. Just then my daughter giggled and said, Daddy, look what Mommy found. I looked at her, and she was pointing at the living room over my shoulder. I turned and was horrified at what my eyes were staring at. I could hear my wife say, Yes, I found this old television in the attic. I plugged it in, and it worked, so I decided to bring it down for the kids to watch. Isn't it great? Maria I knew there was little hope for the ship. I watched helplessly through the lighthouse windows as waves thrashed the vessel without mercy. What good would my light do for them? The wind and rain slammed against the glass hard enough that I feared it may shatter. I could only imagine what the unfortunate souls aboard were experiencing on the torrential seas. I held my position all through the early morning hours, hoping against all odds they would survive the squall. The ship grew smaller and smaller as the vicious breakers pulled it further from shore. Once I lost sight, I knew they were doomed. As the storm subsided and the sun began to rise, I surveyed the sea from the rocky coast. It was hard to believe these tranquil waters were the very same responsible for the violent outburst hours before. I'm not ashamed to say I wept once the tide began bringing debris to the banks. The wreckage brought me to my knees with anguish. The loneliness of my rocky outpost made their demise feel like I had lost someone close to me. I gathered some of the larger pieces, planning to build a memorial on the beach, when something caught my eye. It was moving quickly through the water. I squinted to make out what it was and realized it was a wooden chest. 
The water beneath began bubbling and foaming, moving ever closer to where I stood. Startled, I let the wood fall from my arms as something slowly surfaced. Eyes stared back at me, then faces emerged. I felt frozen to the spot as dozens of swollen, discolored bodies clambered up the rocks with contorted limbs, and I tripped backwards, falling to the sand in a heap. A mob of drowned men and women surrounded me. They looked at me indifferently while I feebly begged them for mercy. Finally, the crowd parted down the middle, and a couple approached, carrying the chest between them. They placed the heavy trunk at my feet. Confused, I looked up at them, still fearing for my life, when an unmistakable sound came from within. I gasped as the man lifted the lid and the woman pulled out a bundle of blankets. The swaddled infant cooed, reaching up for its mother's hair. The father stood behind the mother, gazing down at their beloved child with smiles on their faces. After some time, the mother crouched down, gently handing the child over to me. The father placed his hand on my shoulder, looking deep into my eyes, wordlessly communicating his wishes. I nodded to him, the only gesture I was capable of. He nodded back, and the mob turned away. I held the little girl to my chest as the corpses returned to the sea, finally looking down at her once they disappeared from sight. Enormous turquoise eyes stared back at me beneath a wild mane of curls. The crashing of the tide whispered her name to me. Maria. Maria. Haunting. I died a few days ago and have spent my afterlife haunting the place I spent many happy years. My husband had passed away five years ago, leaving me his fortune, including the home I now haunt. I wander from room to room, gazing at the items that had brought me so much joy throughout my life. I walked into our bedroom and couldn't help but smile as I gazed down at a small music box that he bought me for our one-year wedding anniversary. It played the song that had been played as our first dance, and I always used to play it when I wanted to remember happier times. I heard the front door open downstairs and knew that the two demonic creatures had returned. I walked down to the living room and found my son and daughter-in-law sitting on the couches and deciding what they were going to do with their inheritance. I know this sounds terrible, but I have hated my son for most of his life. He was a horrible child who took every opportunity to disrespect me. His wife was no better, as it is obvious that she only married him for his money. I have even begun to suspect that they might have been responsible for my death. I started to feel weak and knew that my connection to this world was beginning to fade once again. It has become harder and harder to keep my spectral form, and I believe that eventually I will fade away altogether. I let out a sigh and hope this isn't my last time to return. We both look up as my mother collapses to the floor yet again. The dumb bitch is under the illusion that she is dead. Thankfully, it will only be a matter of time before starvation kills her, and I will finally get my inheritance. This demon met me at night. I regret even talking to him. Under the guise of slumber, my nights have been hijacked by terror. I, 
who have always been a lover of sleep, now find myself ensnared in a realm of darkness each time I am too tired to keep my eyes open. This paralysis has seized control of my nights, and I am incapacitated against its grip. In a state of slumber not too long ago, I encountered a figure that would shape the course of my existence. As I lay immobile, captive to the grip of the night, a being emerged before me, its visage shrouded in shadows. It introduced itself as Hara, a demon that had been observing me from the beyond. With a voice both seductive and menacing, Hara proclaimed that I was unique, a singular connection to the realm of sleep, where only in slumber would I find solace and true happiness. The demon offered to guide me to this world, a place to repose from the fear and the pain of the waking world. Hara promised me eternal peace, a release from my suffering. As I gazed into the depths of Hara's obsidian eyes, a feeling of unease crept over me. The demon's words echoed within my mind, promising eternal rest and happiness. But I could not shake the nagging suspicion that something was amiss. Pray tell, what exactly is this eternal sleep you speak of? Is it truly the blissful repose you claim it to be? Hara's lips curled into a sly smile, revealing razor-sharp teeth. Oh, my dear John, eternal sleep is a state of being beyond the comprehension of mortal men. It is a dreamless slumber where all fears, worries, and pain are forgotten. And what of the cost of such slumber? I asked, my voice trembling. What must I sacrifice in order to achieve this paradise? Why, John, the cost is of little consequence. A simple signature upon a contract, and the rest will be taken care of. Consider it a small price to pay for an eternity of peace. And as he finished his sentence, I saw demons, their twisted forms so unkempt and raw, with eyes that blaze like fiery coals and fangs that gnash like saws. I bolted for the door. Desperate to escape, I stumbled upon a door. In a moment of recklessness, I threatened to leave, but Hara warned me against it. The demon's voice was low and menacing, filled with a dark power that filled me with dread. Foolish mortal, Hera hissed. You think to escape the contract so easily? The realm of sleep is eternal, and you are bound to it for all eternity. Leave now and you will face a fate far worse than any nightmare. For a moment, I believed that I was still in a dream, but alas, I could move my head, twitch my face, open and close my eyes. Panic set in as I realized the terrible truth. I was paralyzed. Neighborhood Incubus I staggered to the front door with the last box. It's amazing I got this place for the price I did. The movers stared at me. You got it for the price it's worth. Be careful around here. You got dangerous folk in this neighborhood, one of them said. Dangerous folk? I asked. If you hear screams of bloody murder... Don't go out, the other warned. I stared at them confused. They started walking off, 
and waved by to me. They got in the truck, pulled out of the driveway, and drove off. It was weird. That afternoon was mainly spent unpacking and watching my TV. While I was getting ready for bed, I remembered what that mover had said to me. You got dangerous folk in this neighborhood. Then I searched the recent incidents in my neighborhood. A playlist titled Neighborhood Incubus. First video in the playlist was of a guy getting up late at night to hear someone screaming for help. A blood-curdling scream. He got closer to the source. Seemed to be some person hunched over, screaming in the middle of the road at 1 a.m. Weird, but probably some poor drugged-up guy. Second and third video had been taken down. Fourth, however, was from a few years ago of the house I'd just moved into. It was of the previous house owner in his backyard, hearing a scream at 3 a.m. There was a woman hunched over in the corner of the owner's fence, screaming and shrieking as loud as possible. I stepped back and analyzed what I just watched. What the F? I thought to myself. I searched up a bunch of terms to find out what this was. A term kept repeating, though, Banshee, an old folk tale that was apparently a sign of death. Thankfully, I was able to go to sleep that night. I took sleeping pills. The next morning, I eyed the place where the woman had been seen in the backyard of one of the videos I watched previously. It really disturbed me that there was a person once who screamed, hunched over, and just somehow appeared there. Neighborhood Incubus. Those words were running through my head. Was it one person? Was it multiple people? I rushed to my computer to buy a camera to set up in my backyard. I ordered it. I snuck around the corner, peeping at the backyard. No one was there. I sighed a sigh of relief. I called my friend. We talked for a bit as I sat down on my couch. Behind you! My friend shouted. I turned around to see the woman, hunched over in the corner of my lounger room. She tilted her head up with deranged open eyes. She stared in a terrified way and wailed. Last thing I remember... A car crashed through my house immediately after the woman screamed, almost killing me. They say I was lucky. I say it was a banshee. Lighthouse Keeper My job as a lighthouse keeper is a thankless one, especially during the winter when the sun almost never visits these shores, and you can't tell where the sky ends and the crushing waves begin. Apart from my weekly visits to the town, my shifts consist of short days and long nights on a small barren island, alone with the great Atlantic Ocean. It was during one of these long, dark nights that a great storm came rolling in from the north. I was hoping I could just chill inside, but the light kept going out for some unknown reason, so I spent the night running back and forth between the house and the lighthouse. After getting a few hours of restless sleep, I woke up in the afternoon to find that the storm had died down. Looking out my window, I saw to my great surprise that I had a visitor. A man in a gray overall was standing at the beach seemingly unfazed by the northern wind blowing in behind him. In fact, he was completely motionless, looking up towards the house. I was about to go greet him when, by blind luck, I remembered my kettle of water on the stove. Turning it off, I happened to glance out the kitchen window. 
Another man had joined the first one, this one wearing a blue overall. He looked like a ship engineer. They both stood silent, slack-jawed, staring. The waves washing over their feet didn't seem to bother them. No boat was on the beach. I looked closer. It wasn't before now I noticed their soaked garments, their shriveled hands, their blue, bloated faces. Another head broke the waves. They come from the sea. The Hotel I stayed in a hotel with a friend. It was meant to be haunted. She thought she was a medium, so she tried to speak to the ghost. She said, Make the light flicker if you're here. The light went on and off. Then she said, Just to prove it's not a fluke, can you do that again? The light went on and off again. In the wardrobe we found a box of children's toys. There were also letters people had written to the ghost. There was one letter from someone who had stayed in the hotel addressed to other guests. It said, Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. We were tired, though, and couldn't keep our eyes open. I had a dream that a doll was walking on my chest and poking my eyes out with a needle. In the morning I woke up and got out of bed, but my body was still there. I thought I was having an out-of-body experience, but it's been the same ever since. I just walk the rooms of the hotel, looking at people and stroking their hair in the night. I'm able to type this because the reception staff left their computer on. I expect they'll be freaked out. The above is a message that appeared on the Word document of a night worker in the UK at a well-known chain of budget hotels. The exact name and location withheld to protect the reputation of the business. My house is haunted. I never believed in ghosts, that is, until we moved into our new house. New is a misnomer, really. It was built in the late 1800s, and it needed a lot of work. A farmhouse positioned all by itself in the middle of three rolling fields. The internet hadn't even been run to it yet. The closest neighbor, a half mile away. Blake and I had gotten a great deal, and figured we could renovate it room by room over the next few years to eventually sell it for a profit. We moved in in the summer and spent three happy months cleaning, painting, decorating, and upgrading everything in sight. Slowly, it became a home. Then, fall arrived. The temperature dropped. At some point, the home had been upgraded to central heating, so we knew it had a furnace, but we'd never tried to run it. Shivering before bed one night, we crossed our fingers as we flipped the thermostat to heat and heard new sounds cascade through the walls. Warmth flowed from the vents. Later that night, I awoke feeling dizzy, very dizzy. My stomach turned as I sat up in bed and I instantly vomited. Gasping for air, I shook Blake, but he wasn't responding. I slapped his face. He barely stirred. I don't remember calling 911. I just remember waking up on the front lawn. Someone saying not to go back in the house. Something about a gas leak. Watching them zip up the body bag. The next few weeks are a blur. I recall people in the house. Repairmen. Mourners. He died too young. Flowers. My mind must have addled. By the gas I'd inhaled. As I kept seeing glimpses of him in the crowd. Eventually... I was alone again, or so I thought. That first night on my own, I heard him, sobbing, gut-wrenching sorrow coming from the room we used to share. I couldn't muster the courage to enter. For hours I listened in terrified silence, 
until all fell quiet again. I never slept. In the morning, it came from the kitchen. Weeping met my ears again. The fear returned. But in the light of day, I had the fortitude to investigate. I peered around the corner, and there he was, my beautiful Blake, sitting at the table, crying over a photo of me. Love overcame fear. I reached for him. Far from being soothed by my touch, he screamed and fled the room. Now it was my turn for tears. I never saw him again. Weeks later, I heard a new sound, a child's laughter. New apparitions manifested, a young girl, adults I'd never known. I didn't understand why they suddenly started haunting me. Strange voices rang through the walls. I can't believe he sold it to you so cheap. Gas Lake killed his husband, but not before the husband slapped him awake and saved his life. He just wanted to get rid of it. What was his name again? Blake. And then it came back to me, Blake waking up, hearing him call for help as I blacked out. Darkness. I never believed in ghosts until I became one. 5 Things You Need to Know About Werewolves The chances that someone you know and love suffers from lycanthropy are extremely slim. The disease, or curse, as some still believe, was largely eradicated in the Middle Ages. Wide-ranging purges very nearly wiped out the malady by wiping out its victims, a crude but effective strategy. In modern times, lycanthropy is largely unheard of, so much so that many consider it a myth. Although it's extraordinarily rare, the condition still persists. It's unlikely that you will ever encounter anyone who is lycanthrope positive, but if you do find that a friend or family member is infected or cursed, here's what you need to know. First of all, the survivor of a werewolf attack will be in a state of denial. They won't admit to having any contact with a lycanthrope whatsoever. This might be a form of limited amnesia, symptomatic of the disease or curse itself. A fear of being labeled mentally unstable or the simple human drive for self-preservation. Nobody wants to be ostracized, quarantined, and euthanized, so they will under no circumstances speak of the incident or admit to the possibility of infection. For instance, if your wife is assaulted by a lycanthrope during a late-night jog, she will not tell you about it, and any inquiries you make will be answered with phrases like, it was fine, okay, and nothing unusual. You may have noticed the scratches on her back when she left the bathroom door slightly ajar, and you just happened to see her getting out of the shower, but you'll probably think those are from something else, because you're pretty sure the only jogging she's doing at 10.30 p.m. is over to her boyfriend's place for a quickie, and you're just waiting until you have solid evidence and a good lawyer before you confront her. Secondly, in the week or so prior to a full moon, the infected or cursed individual will become agitated, irritable, and overly sensitive to sounds and smells. The smallest annoyances will enrage her. She might throw a wine glass at your head with enough force to gouge the plaster behind the couch because the TV is too loud and that plate of nachos con queso you made to munch on while you watch the game absolutely reeks. Third, the transformation from human to werewolf happens very quickly. It's not like in the movies where there is a three and a half minute montage of the infected or cursed 
writhing on the floor, howling in agony, while their bones and ligaments stretch and deform. Within 15 to 20 seconds, that 5-510-pound yoga instructor that you married six years ago will morph into a hulking, coarse-haired beast, snarling around six-inch fangs and swiping at you with razored claws. Fourth, silver really does kill werewolves, and it doesn't have to be in the form of a bullet. Any silver will do, like that cake server from your wedding reception. The only thing in this marriage that has lasted. The one lying in the kitchen sink, smeared with apple pie filling because you wanted a slice and never got around to buying a regular cake server. That'll work just fine. Lastly, but perhaps most crucially, once dead, the werewolf will immediately morph back into its human form, leaving no trace of the monster that had been trying to tear your arms out of their sockets just a moment ago. You will find yourself standing in your blood-splattered kitchen, looking down at the naked body of your dead wife, with a silver cake server sticking out of her neck, while the police pound on your apartment door because the neighbors heard you fighting again and called 911. Well, there you have it. Five important facts about werewolves. I hope this has been informative. If I run across any other information or insights that might be helpful, I'll try to post them, if I can. But don't count on it. I don't think they have internet where I'm going. I wolf you. Doc, you shouldn't be in here with me. It's too dangerous. Henry, you're fine. I promise you. It's safe. The full moon isn't until next week. I feel like it's better for us to have our sessions face to face. Don't you? I looked over at the psychiatrist that just stepped into my state-of-the-art military prison cell. Why was he so sure I wasn't about to eat him alive. Doc, it's been over three months. I can barely sleep. I thought turning myself in would have helped. I'm still anxious all the time. Yesterday on TV, I was watching a show, and an image of a fucking puppy sent me into a full panic attack. I know, Henry, but you have made great improvements, I assure you. None of this is your fault. I know it's not my fault now. When I first learned that I was a werewolf about a year ago, I was racked with guilt. The morning after every full moon, I would wake up feeling awful, having no memory of the previous night. I would never have believed it if I didn't have video proof showing my instant transformation. Henry, it's okay. The scientists here are trying their best. They will find something, some virus or disease, that they can treat. In the meantime, I must continue to treat your mind. Please let me... What's the point? Henry, the point is that we can help you feel better. You're safe here in this facility. Even when you turn, it's under safe conditions. No one will get hurt ever again. The symptoms, though, that you show are of acute stress disorder and PTSD. We must treat that for your own health. I don't know. You remind me of one of my first patients, a young man that was afflicted with PTSD from a form of anesthesia emergence. He didn't remember it, but he woke up in the middle of invasive surgery in the OR. Due to the drugs, he was unable to move, but he felt everything. It was only after several excruciating minutes that a nurse noticed, and they put him under again. Why is that supposed? Suddenly, another man, 
Clearly a scientist burst into the room along with a soldier. My doctor and this new man leave and seem to argue outside. After about an hour, they return. Henry, I... The new scientist interrupts. Henry, my name is Dr. Mueller. I'm a physicist. We know what is happening. You are not a werewolf. What we believe is happening is that you are somehow phasing out of this universe into another one. A massive wolf is replacing you in ours. That wolf is not you. What the hell does that mean? Where do I go? Well, we theorize that you are switching places with that wolf in its world. An earth full of other massive dire wolves. What do you mean? What is happening to me in that other world? We don't know. I'm convinced my dog has started to hate me, or a demon possessed him. My boyfriend brought in a dachshund puppy. The dachshund was so adorable. My boyfriend had always wanted a dog, but his parents wouldn't let him have one, so he got a dog as an adult. The first year was challenging. The puppy was wild, hyperactive, biting, and destroying everything. By the beginning of the second year, the dog calmed down and began to obey and learn commands. We were happy together. At night, the dog used to come to me and lay his head next to mine. It was beautiful. Then something changed. One night, the dog was whining at the door, so I went out with him. The grass was wet, the sidewalk was muddy, and the dog got dirty. When we got back, I was wiping the dog's paw, and that's when the dog turned his head sharply and started growling, and I felt the dog's teeth bite deep into my hand. The dog was furious, and I was in shock. The dog started growling aggressively and attacking me. I was terrified and confused. Blood was coming out of my hand. I ran out of the bathroom with fear and locked the dog in there. When my boyfriend came back, he didn't understand what had happened. He said that maybe I had caught the dog's paw badly, and the dog took that as a risk. But I hadn't done anything unusual. That was the first time he attacked me, but not the last. Before that, the dog was always happy to see me. When I came home, the dog came running to greet me with a wagging tail and an enthusiastic bark. Now the dog stares at me, or attacks me. I'm afraid the dog will bite my throat in my sleep one day, and I'll bleed out. Thoughts going on in the dog's head. I love my humans so much. We are a pack. But one human is scared of me, and probably doesn't like me anymore. It happened once when I got mud on my paws. Luckily, my humans will always clean me up. Well, at the time, my human was washing me, and as she was wiping my paws with a towel, I felt a sharp pain in my paw. I turned my head and was furious. A dark being was surrounding my human. It had skin with spikes, eyes, and teeth that were blacker than the darkness. The tongue was long and bloody red. It wrapped its hand around my human's arm, and I bit down to scare the creature away from my human. I attacked it, but I bit my human instead. To this day, I protect my human from that dark being, but my human is more and more afraid of me because of it. I try to explain that I am protecting her, but she does not understand me. All she hears is barking. The Enigma Hotel Eli Steele and his partner Clifton Underwood entered room number 223. 
It had two beds and an open patio that can be accessed through a sliding glass door. Eli flicked the lid of the Zippo lighter, looking around the room as Clifton followed behind him carrying their bags. Underwood set their bags down on one of the beds, closing the door and rubbed a hand over his face where there was a scar under his right eye. Let's get set up, said Eli, looking over at his partner. Clifton nodded and opened one of the bags, taking out a couple of pieces of equipment suited for catching anything paranormal, an audio recorder, an inductive probe. Eli gazed out the sliding glass door. Do you think we'll find anything? Clifton asked. Eli sighed, leaning back in his chair, taking the Zippo out of his pocket, flipping its lid open then closed. His tired eyes took in the room's layout as Clifton used an inductive probe. Get out. The inductive probe whispered. Clifton locked eyes with Eli. Grabbing an audio recorder, Steele pressed one of the buttons. Why do you want us to get out? There was a bit of silence before the light fixtures on the wall began to shake and flicker, causing the room to go light, then dark. There in the darkness stood a woman not dressed for the current time, her form twitching and shifting, as if trying to stay visible to both men. Eli, Clifton whispered, glancing at his partner, who held the audio recorder tightly in his hand before he was thrown through the sliding glass doors, sliding into the wooden fence outside. As his attention was on Eli, he did not see the apparition of the woman now standing just a few feet in front of him. She raised her hand, making his back hit the wall, gripping him by the neck as he slowly slid up to the ceiling. Clifton kicked his feet and coughed as he grasped at the pressure around his neck, trying to breathe. Eli stood up as he spat blood onto the concrete floor of the patio and slowly got to his knees. Hey! Eli yelled at the woman, who jerked her head in his direction, momentarily causing her to lose her hold on Underwood, who fell to a slump on the floor. You want us out so badly? Then come and get me! Eli snarled at her watching her face twisted into anger as she ran towards him screaming. Holding the Zippo in his right hand and a silver cross soaked in holy water in the other, he waited for the perfect opportunity to jab the cross into her chest as she pounced on him. He lit the cross with the Zippo, setting her ablaze, and rolled off to the side away from her. The woman screamed and thrashed before she became nothing more than a dark, ashy mist. Steele stumbled inside and went to Clifton's side, checking his pulse. When he felt nothing, he put an ear to his chest, hearing a heartbeat. Clifton took a deep breath before sitting up, looking around the room in a panic. Sh she Clifton looked around, wildly bracing himself for yet another attack. She is gone now. Eli stood looking at the mess they had caused, asking, The hotel isn't going to be happy about this mess, as he dusted the broken glass from his button-up shirt. Clifton calmed down a bit, taking in his surroundings, no longer sensing the woman. Yes, it would seem so. He shakingly held up his hand to Eli, who took it, helping his partner to his feet. Clifton leaned against the wall, taking a moment to relax as Eli sat in a chair next to him. Well, <laughs> at least we can conclude that this place and their rooms are indeed haunted, chuckled Eli. Clifton groaned tiredly. Please tell me that this is the only room that needs cleansing. Eli would not tell Clifton 
that they have another job at a haunted hospital after this one. No, for now he would let his old friend rest and break the news to him as they drove to their next destination. Since the case of the Enigma Hotel was now at a close. We ask the ghost what is on the other side. We are paranormal investigators. We use a device called the Polter Pod to communicate with ghosts. By asking questions, sometimes we get the answer. It is best if the ghost answers us intelligently. For example, it remembers its name. So far, the ghosts have been reluctant to converse. Occasionally, they've only said a word or two. The ghosts are more talkative in this old abandoned house, as we are here to investigate it. We are in the dark basement right now. We're only using night vision. It's time to ask the first question. Is anyone here? Silence. We want to talk. We're interested in what's on the other side. We know you're here. Please give us a sign. Is anyone here? Yes. Whoa, did you hear that? Sure. It was a distinct yes. The spirit answered as yes. Time for the next question. What's your name? Tom. We have an intelligent answer. He said his name. He remembers his name. What does it look like on the other side? Patience. Why, you haven't moved on? Nowhere. What do you mean? Why didn't you go to heaven, hell, or purgatory? None. What the hell? I think he's confused. Maybe he doesn't believe heaven exists, and that's why he hasn't moved on. Do you believe in heaven? None. Maybe if you believe, you'll go there. You'll see your acquaintances. All here. How does it look on the other side? Crowded. No one has moved on? No. Wait, wait. Does that mean that every being who died is still on earth with us? Yes. But how is that possible? How is that possible? Hate. Something scratched me. I, I don't think we should ask any further. This ghost is obviously confused. He's probably stuck in his thoughts, so he can't move on. It gives me the creeps. Me too. I feel exhausted, like something is taking the energy out of me. Why are you attacking us? Feel. Hate. Ow! It hurts me so much. <laughs> Let's get out of here. I don't like it. He's kind of raging and repeating the word hate. Wait. I've still got the tape recorded here. Sometimes I catch things on it other than through the polter pod. Dictaphone recording. Why are you wasting your time with them? Everyone will find there's nothing after death. And we are just enduring here. In nothingness. A waste of time. I'm just killing time. We have eternity. My life was miserable, so I ended it. I feel even worse. But now, I can't end my existence. A ghost doesn't die. I would prefer it. If there is nothing after death. This is nothing. Hey. But we realize that. I don't want to realize it. 
but I can absorb energy from the living and feel at least a little bit of life. I'll have to try that too. But won't it hurt them? I don't care. I hate them. Oh, that's why you're attacking them. Out of jealousy that they're still alive. I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at duchessofdark and two. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness, your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.